Hello, and welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Muscle, and it's May 23rd, 2014, and this is episode 10 <laughs> Fiber and Fabric. So, today we're going to talk about a, a, a topic that a, a listener or a viewer suggested. And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting who suggested this originally, but I thought it was a great idea. It was basically to talk about how to how to choose or substitute fibers for different kinds of projects. Like, how do you go about finding the right yarn for, say, a pattern that you've chosen? And if you need to substitute, what's a good way to do that without kind of sabotaging the success of your project? So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll do the usual just kind of filling you in on some some of what I've been knitting and spinning, and um, a few other bits and bobs, as the English like to say. They have so many great expressions. <laughs> okay, so a couple of announcements, first of all. Um, one of them is that this will be, uh, I looked two weeks ahead of now, I, I record every two weeks, and uh, two weeks from now is actually the very day that I fly to France, so I will not be recording that day. Obvs. But um, I will record as soon as I can after that. It may not be until the Friday of the following week. But I am going to at least record some on-site video and uh, particularly anything that relates to fiber while I'm there and post it if at all possible. And if it looks like I'm not going to be able to post it all while I'm there, if I'm just, if my internet connection is not cooperating, for instance, or if I can't, just somehow can't get it out, then um, then I'll let you know on the Dark Matter Knits blog. Um, but I should be able to get something out. I mean, it won't look anything like this with, you know, the stuff edited in at the beginning and the end. It'll probably be just bits of raw video. But um, but I'll get you something just to... So you don't miss me terribly while I'm gone. Because you would, right? I'll miss you, actually. Okay, so there's that. And... Um, the other, a couple of other announcements. One of them is that uh, there have been a couple more reviews on iTunes, um, particularly Click Clark and LK Memphis. Thank you so much for your reviews. And you guys, I got my first two star review, <laughs> which you would think would hurt my feelings, but actually, I feel like okay, like it's 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 nice. Like you know that everybody's just being nice to you when they all give you five star reviews, which is how, th how it's been up until now. But when somebody gives you a bad review, you know you've really arrived, you know? <laughs> it's like people feel like they don't have to be nice to you anymore. So I actually kind of wear it like a badge of honor, truthfully. Uh, another thing that I wanted, these are so such unrelated pieces of information, but I wanted to share them with you. Um, another little bit that I learned this week that I just thought was so fascinating. Um, as you probably know, if you've watched any previous episodes, I'm a total history geek. I used to teach history. And, uh, and I learned this week that the word shawl is actually originally a Persian word, which makes perfect sense when you think about it. I mean, think about all the, the Silk Road trade and um, apparently shawls as a garment originated in India, perhaps in a town called Shalit, which might explain. They're not quite sure whether that's the origin of the word, but it may very well be. And um, and the word, the, the earliest uh, instance of the word that has been found in writing is in the 1660s. And then um, the earliest instance of European women wearing shawls is in the 1760s, which I was really surprised by. I assumed that pretty much from the time that knitting was introduced, to Europe that shawls would have been right on its heels. And I know that, no heel pun intended, but I know that stockings were really the the first thing to make it big in European knitting. Um, but I, just in my head, I always assumed that shawls were right in there from the beginning, and apparently they weren't. So, you know, when you read all of those, um, you know, kind of turn of the 19th century novels like Jane Austen, where everybody's wearing shawls, that's relatively recent fashion. Um, well, relatively, right? I mean, it's it's about as far back to them as the 1960s would be to us. 
So I guess not that recent, but still, it just, it kind of surprised me. And I thought it was really fascinating that that was the, the origin. Um, and then the, the final thing, again, unrelated announcement, although it does have to do with shawls. Uh, I have a friend who has um, started putting out some collections of um, Wild West themed patterns. And I wanted to tell you about them because particularly since I live in Texas and you don't see this kind of inspiration very much, um, most of the the kind of um, geographically inspired knits that you see come from more northern climates. So I thought it was really interesting to see a Southwest inspired collection. Um, so the, the designer's name is Stephanie Talent, and that's Stephanie with two N's and Talent with two L's. And uh, she's Steph Cat on Ravelry. And she has this series of booklets that are called the Wild West collectively. Uh, and they're kind of broken up into collections of, I think, four to six patterns. Um, one of them, or two of them are focused on lace. There's one um, focused on stranded color work, and there are some more in the works. And um, I just, I think they're lovely. And, and one of the things I've always liked about Stephanie's work is that she, um, she like Isolde Teague and some other designers, um, really designs for larger women as well as, um, you know, kind of the classic size M and, um, and models her own knitwear, which I think is really great. And I, I love the photographs that she's got in her books really lovely. So um, do check that out. Again, it's she's Steph Cat on Ravelry, which is probably the easiest way to find her. Or you can look up her website at sunsetcat.com. And by the way, I should say, if you have any announcements that you'd like me to share, just anything that um, you want to let the, the rest of the podcast viewers know about, um, do feel free to, to get in touch with me. Um, my email address is darkmatternits at gmail.com. Uh, you're welcome to, or you can just post it in the, in the Ravelry group. And I've also got a thread there, um, where people can show off new, uh, like if you've, if you make things or make patterns or anything like that, and you'd like to show it off, uh, there's now a thread in the group for that as well. Uh, kind of, I got the idea from the Knit Girls. Um, they have a thread for this as well. So I think that's it as far as kind of beginning announcements go. Um, let me show you what I've been working on and that will kind of segue into the main topic for today. Um, so actually this isn't something I've been working on but I had to show you because I've just been kind of drooling over this all week. Um, I know I've mentioned before I work for Cooperative Press. I, I work for, part-time for them doing uh, a lot of their book design. And um, and Shannon Oki, who's the um, owner of the press, my boss basically, uh, went to Maryland Sheep and Wool. They had a, a corporate press had a booth there and I wasn't able to go. And she very nicely got me a present while she was there. And I have to show you because it's just it's so nice. Okay, I'm going to show you. Okay, there's this. Now you have to understand, and the, the wool, it is not this orange. Um, I love warm colors. Love them. I loved them before they were cool. Before yellow was cool, I loved yellow. So anything like orange, fall colors, tan, you know, citrus colors, love it. So there's this. This is Bugga, by the way, cephalopod yarns. Love them. So this is, this color is oddity. And it is not nearly this, it's not eye searing, but it is, uh, it is a beautiful, um, it's not quite pumpkin, it's more primary than that. And then there's this, which, oh, I guess it's, they're all oddity. They must be one-off colors. Um, so I'll stop calling them oddity now. And this, and then there's one more. Oh my God. What should I do with this? It's like, oh. Okay, so it's, it's a sport weight and each one is 400 yards. So, you know, I wear an extra large, so this isn't really quite enough. Well, it's not enough for a long sleeve sweater for me. It may be enough for a short sleeve sweater. Hmm. Oh, it's just, I love this yarn so much. I've knit with it before and, um, and I love their colors. I mean, they're just 
stunning. Again, they're not quite this bright, but they are this beautiful. Gorgeous. So that was kind of my acquisition for the week, if you like. Um, now what I've been working on, um, one of the main things I've been working on is I got back to some spinning and I finished this up. This uh, I've talked about before. It's by wooden, two, two different bats by wooden spinner, um, a Mississippi based, uh, dyer. And, um, one of them is called spring fling and that's the green. So I took two different bats and plied them together as a two ply. So, um, the green is called Spring Fling, and they're actually slightly different fiber makeups, but I th they were close enough that I thought they would still work together. Uh, so the green is made with um, Coriadale, Silk, Sari Silk, and Angora, so that's why there's a little bit of a, I uh, might not be able to see it very well here, but there's just a little bit of, of a halo coming off it there. You can kind of see it on top there. So that's the green. And then the blue is really where all the little pops of, um, of sprinkles come from. And that colorway is bluebells. And the fiber content in that case is merino, silk noil, and those are the little um, sprinkly bits, and angelina. And the angelina is, um, is really quite spar. It's, or spare. It's not um, overwhelming. And you really can't even... It's not just that the camera's not picking it up, it's, there's really not much in it. Um, but yeah, I like, I like how it came out. Um, I don't know if it's just that I'm a beginner or if Coriadale is just a little bit trickier to spin. The Coriadale was tough, the green stuff. Um, I really felt like I was struggling with it a lot. And maybe it was because I was trying to make it spin to the, roughly the same circumference as the blue and it didn't want to be I don't know but um I was kind of fumbling with that a bit the merino the the purple purpley blue stuff was wonderful to work with um and these were each two ounce bats so all together this well almost two ounces they were um one and three quarter ounce bats so all together this is um a three and a half ounce skein and um it amounts to about 368 yards I have no idea what I'm going to do with this. I'll just, um, I'll probably make some kind of uh, scarf, cowl, who knows? It's probably gonna go away for a little while. It's a pretty wintry feeling yarn and uh, living in Texas, there's not gonna be any need for anything like that for a little while, so. And I got a lot of other stuff to work on. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of what I've been working on, I can't show you because I've, um, I've got a lot of designs that I'm working on. Um, I'm pretty excited about them actually. The other knitting, where is the, okay, no, I can't show you any knitting. Okay. So I guess that moves us into the main segment that I wanted to talk about, which is, um, how to choose fibers for particular patterns. So, um, Yarn substitution is always a bit tricky, right? And and typically people are faced with this issue because um, either A, the yarn that's recommended in the pattern is no longer available, or you're, you want to buy from a local yarn store and maybe your LYS doesn't carry that yarn, or, um, or you just want to use something else. Like maybe the original yarn is too expensive and you want to substitute something from your stash or something that's um, less costly. So there could be all kinds of reasons why you might want to choose a different yarn than what's recommended in the pattern. And, um, and one of the potential pitfalls that you can run into when, um, when you're choosing an alternate yarn is fiber content. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what yarns are made of and how that's going to affect the finished fabric that you make and so that you can kind of use some of that information when you're doing yarn substitution next time. So there are kind of a couple of, this is a, a topic that's big enough that we probably could revisit it a couple of times, but the two main things I want to focus on today are um, the fiber, the, the ply structure, how or how the yarn is actually constituted, what its structure is, and then the fiber itself, the actual, 
you know, whether it's wool or alpaca or cotton or whatever it, it's made of. So let's talk about fiber first. Um, and some of this you may have heard before, and some of this you might be quite familiar with, but if you really haven't ever, well, even if you have, whether you are familiar with these topics or not, um, the two books that you really, really want to check out and probably own if you're seriously into fiber are these two, both by Clara Parks and their companion volumes. One is The Knitter's Book of Yarn and the other is The Knitter's Book of Wool. This one came out first and is more comprehensive and deals with things like plant fiber and um, man-made fibers. And then The Book of Wool obviously just focuses on wool. And uh, they're amazing books. They give you all kinds of information about, um, for, for spinners as well as knitters and crocheters, about um, how, how yarns are made, how the crimp of a wool affects the way that it behaves, um, how to, t there's even, if I'm remembering correctly, there's even a section, I think in the Knitter's Book of Yarn, about if you've lost the ball band and you've just got this random ball of yarn and you have no idea what it is, um, how to do a burn test on it to tell at least what kind of fiber content it has. Um, just really, really great information. And there are a bunch of, each one has multiple, many, many patterns that, uh, that are designed to take advantage of particular kinds of fibers. So highly recommended for your library. So the, the author's name is Clara Parks and um, P-A-R-K-E-S, Knitter's Book of Yarn, Knitter's Book of Wool. And it says knitters, but, um, and the patterns are all for knitting, but certainly if you're a crocheter, a spinner, or a weaver, you will get a lot of very useful information out of those books as well. Okay, so the, kind of the main issues with fiber are these. Um, wool is, there's a reason why a lot of designers like designing with wool. It's because it has a lot of properties that make it really easy to work with. And one of them is that it's got a lot of um, a lot of bounce to it. If you've ever seen, um, I wish I had a, a raw fleece on me. I, I don't have one of those. But if you've ever seen uh, a raw sheep fleece, you'll have seen that there's um, the hairs had these funny little, it looks like somebody put a crimping iron on them, um, if you remember those from the, the 80s and 90s. Um, and the more of that crimp that that hair has, that's that's what helps give wool that, that bounciness. And you know if you've ever swatched with wool that, um, well, you might not even notice this if you've swatched with wool, but if you swatch with cotton or linen or some other plant fiber, you'll immediately notice that your gauge doesn't look as even. Your stitches look kind of wonky. And the reason for that is that those plant fibers, um, hemp is another one, they don't have that same kind of bounce to them. So any unevenness in your stitching is going to show up in the fabric. Whereas with wool, it's a little more elastic. So it's going to just kind of bounce into evenness regardless of whether your stitches are perfectly even or not. So um, so that not only affects the overall look of the fabric, if you work with plant fiber, you're just going to get, um, particularly if it's in stockinette, you're just going to get a rougher looking, a more kind of rustic looking fabric than if you do it in a uh, an animal fiber. Um, it also means that this is what if you've ever knit a sweater out of cotton and wondered or even just bought a commercial sweater out of cotton and wondered why it started growing over the course of the day it's for the same reason wool has this this bounce pack to it that um, continues to work throughout the day whereas cotton um, doesn't have that that spring or that crimp to keep pulling it into shape so it'll just kind of keep growing over the course of the day so what does this mean? Well, it means, for instance, and I've made this mistake before earlier on in my knitting career, I made my husband a sweater that was designed for wool. It was this, you know, big, um, oversized, cabled, long, I mean, heavy sweater and um, in worsted. So that, you know, a relatively thick yarn. So even, you know, even heavier. And I knitted in 
I think it was a cotton wool blend, actually. It was that uh, that brown sheep, cot was it cotton fleece? It was just their cotton, their cotton wool blend. It was in that. And there was just enough cotton in it that um, the weight of the sweater just kind of, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's halfway down his thighs, which looks fine. Uh, it's, it's a style that works for most women. It's not really one that's favored by most men. So, um, I mean, he loves it anyway. He wears it around the house, but it's, um, it's not what I would have preferred. So if you've got a sweater that is, if you've got a pattern that is, it is particularly if it's a garment, a sweater, if it's designed for wool, knit it in wool, or at least a, a wool blend that is mostly wool. Now, if it's acrylic that it's blended with, that's usually okay. Um, acrylic doesn't, doesn't stretch out in the same way that, um, that cotton does. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess sort of the, the big first message is, um, patterns for plant fibers probably ought to be made with plant fibers and patterns for animal fibers probably ought to be made with animal fibers. It's a, you're, you'll be much safer if you, if you do that. Sorry, I need to take a drink. I've been really sick the last couple of days. Okay. Um, within animal fibers, there's another big issue to contend with, and that is that not all animal fibers are made alike. Um, wool is, if you, if you look at pictures, a really good way of getting a sense of this is to look at pictures of fiber animals online, and you'll see that some of them have very curly hair and some of them don't. Um, alpaca hair is not nearly as crimpy, say, as, um, as merino. And so when you, here, let me show you some examples. Here is a hat that I designed for an alpaca yarn. And um, my thinking was this, that when you knit with alpaca, it doesn't have the same bounce to it. It doesn't, um, it doesn't tend to, to hold its shape as well. And um, it's very floppy. It's very drapey. It's great for shawls. It's great for um, anything that needs to, you know, just kind of flow. Anything that needs to hold its shape, it's just not as well designed for. But I wanted to make a hat. So um, basically what I did was I, um, I didn't worry as much. This is my, the Navasota hat, by the way. I didn't worry as much about the ribbing. Um, I did do a ribbing just to give it a little bit of pull in here, but I knew it wasn't going to do that much. You know, I mean, when you look at the hat, when it's off my head, the ribbing really doesn't pull in very much. And I knew from swatching that even if I did it on a much smaller needle, it didn't make any difference. It would just stretch right out again. So the ribbing in some ways is just there for show. And um, I did some cabling in here in a kind of rib pattern to, um, you know, to kind of keep some some pullback on the hat so that it would kind of in some ways kind of keep pulling back in um but you kind of just have to make this uh quite a bit smaller than your head and and then i realized you know this really needs to be a slouchy hat because alpaca just wants to flump over it doesn't want to stand up um if you put a, mer a, a merino hat on your head a slouchy one you could actually get it to stand right up um, but this hat now is just going to flop right back over. So it may as well be slouchy. So with alpaca, um, just bear in mind that it's very drapey. It's not going to have, you're not going to be able to get a tailored look out of this yarn. You're going to get a drapey look. And, um, and this fiber is very, very warm. Alpaca is extremely warm, more, warmer than wool. Probably, I mean, really just as warm and just as soft in my mind as uh, Kiviet or cashmere. I'm sure that's not really true, but it's, it, it's a lot less expensive and it's extremely warm. Um, so that was another reason that, that also factored into the design. I put some, some uh, eyelets into the stitch pattern just to allow some of the heat <laughs> to vent off your head. Um, so, alpaca. Drapey, not much structure. 
Now here's its polar opposite. Merino, number one, and also with a different ply structure, and I'll get into the ply structure in just a minute. But um, this yarn is a merino and it has a lot of bounce to it. It's a little hard to, let me see if I can get it to, you, yeah, you can kind of see here how it, it really has a lot of sproing to it. And this is, this is Anzula for better or for worsted, one of the springier yarns. I mean, it just feels like mwah, mwah, when you squeeze it. It's lovely. So um, this yarn has a lot of structure to it. And actually what I'm going to design with this is something much more tailored looking, much more like a, a jacket, because it um, it really holds its shape nicely and has a, a very finished look to it. If I made a hat out of this, I could get it to stand straight up off my head. And so it's going to look good as a more tailored jacket or uh, perhaps a skirt would be, don't make a skirt out of, out of alpaca. <laughs> don't do it. Don't make it out of cotton either, unless you've got a pattern that's really well designed for it. Um, but Merino's great because it's got, it'll just go right back to where it started. And I thought about, you know, I really, this yarn, when I was trying to decide what to design with it, I was thinking something like this. I just realized it's very similar looking, but look at this, okay? Actually, this is a great illustration. Um, the stitch definition on this is much better, um, but in some ways the um, the stitch pattern gets a little lost in here. I just kind of felt like this was going to be a lot of work for not as much payoff because it kept wanting to pull back in even after I blocked it. You know, I wanted it to be kind of more like this so you could see all the stitching, um, but it keeps wanting to you know, kind of squoomch up into its original shape. So I just thought, really, what's the point of doing, <coughs> excuse me, doing a stitch pattern when it just looks, the hand dyeing and the, the structure of it is just so nice in very simple stitching. So I'm, I'm actually doing something, doing a kind of color block in Tarja sort of thing with this and see how that turns out. Okay, so actually while we're, oh, one, one, one more thing about fiber and then we'll um, switch over to ply structure. This is another good example of, um, you know, thinking about what kind of fiber you're using. I think I showed this to you before. This is a shawl I finished fairly recently, and this is a bamboo cotton blend yarn that I knit this with. And um, it's a worsted, worsted or DK weight, I can't recall which. Um, so, it, you know, it's kind of challenging thinking about, you know, knowing that bamboo and cotton, both of which are plant fibers, are going to be super floppy, super stretchy. I didn't really want to make a garment out of them. I'm not really a um, a short sleeve top might have worked, but that's not really my thing. Um, so, you know, I was trying to think of something, and also the fact that it was variegated meant that I wanted to try to keep it from pooling a little bit. Well, that's the worst of the pooling right there, but no, there's some more. <laughs> but mostly I was able to, you know, to kind of avoid pooling. Um, so I just thought, okay, a shawl is clearly the way to go with this because a shawl is supposed to be floppy. And, um, you know, in my climate, bamboo and cotton for a shawl is actually kind of a nice choice. I mean, I can wear this even on a 75, 80 degree day and, uh, and still be completely comfortable. So plant fibers are great for uh, keeping relatively cool and um, and when, when you need some drape and you're not really caring about whether the piece is going to hold its shape or not. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about ply structure as well, or the structure of yarns. And that what I'm gonna encourage you to do if you've never done this before is to uh, actually take a look, like a really close look at your yarn when you are first starting to work with it and trying to figure out what to make with it. Um, 
let's take this Anzula for better or for worse to it again. One of the reasons why this has such spring to it is not just because it's merino, um, but also because it has a really tight twist. Let's see if I can get it to... You, yeah, you can really see, I mean, it's the twist on this is almost horizontal, right? So that's going to give it some spring. And in addition to that, the more plies it has, generally speaking, the rounder the yarn is going to be, which is also going to make it squishier. So by way of contrast, uh, let's take a look at my spun yarn again. So here, this is a two ply. And it's probably a little hard to, to see here, but a two ply is going to be flatter than, <coughs> oh, excuse me. A two ply is going to be flatter in structure than a three ply, which if you think about it, kind of makes sense, right? Okay, you didn't need to listen to me coughing over and over again. Let's try that again. A two ply can, if you think about, you know, the, the way that these are twisting around and around each other, it has more of an opportunity to squish flat than a three ply does. A three ply, you know, kind of has to, <laughs> it kind of has to maintain a three dimensional structure um, because there's just more giving it depth. So um, a lot of times, you know, like a good rule of thumb is that a, a two ply is really great for something like a shawl when you want the lace to kind of flatten out and show you don't want it, you don't want the yarn to fill in all those gaps all those yarn overs that you so laboriously created you want it to kind of squish down and open up the lace you want the holes to be visible whereas um, with something like this like if you have a lot of garter stitch for instance in that case you would want a three ply or more because you want that squish and that depth to it. You want, um, you want all the holes to be filled in. You want a real meat to that yarn. So this, this yarn, this is one of the reasons why this just doesn't, just isn't quite as, quite as uh, satisfying in the eyelet pattern as, um, as a two ply would be because this yarn is so thick that it just wants to fill in all those holes and um, so it'd be great for cables this is this would be a great cabling yarn because it would just those cables would just whoomp, plump up off the off the surface of the sweater but uh, but not so much for lace um, you will also see yarns like this. This is a, a yarn from Handmaiden, I think. I've had this for a long time. In fact, this is frogged from a project that I started working on and gave up on. Um, but this is actually a singles. Um, so this is a this is one ply. It may look like more than one until you look closely and you realize, no, it's just one that's got some twist to it, but it's not actually twisted around anything else. Um, these kinds of yarns that only are just one ply. Uh, Noro Korean is probably the most popular example. In fact, a lot of Noro yarns are like this. Here's another one. So this is, uh, well, I think this is Noro Korean sock. And uh, I, this is, a, you know, an example of how I don't listen to my own, my own advice. Um, but this is, this I also started a long time ago. I just need to frog it. But I started knitting a kind of like an Oxford shirt. It's a Sally Melville pattern from her Mother Daughter Knits book. And I thought it would look really cool in this um, in this yarn. And one of the problems with it is, I don't know if you can see how biased that is, how it's kind of woo, leaning way over. And, uh, and the reason for that is that with these kinds of, of singles yarns, um, there isn't that other, you know, you've got, like if you've got at least two plies, they both might be twisted in the clockwise direction and then when they're plied together they're plied in a counterclockwise direction or the other way around and um, and that helps balance the yarn so that the you know your knitting doesn't go sliding off in one direction or another um, but with a the singles there's nothing to counteract that that leaning 
it's got a lot of energy in it and it wants to kind of lean in that same direction. So um, if you're working with a yarn like this, either, um, you know, just suck it up and deal with the biasing, which in some cases might be fine, and a sock, maybe not that big a deal, um, or work with a stitch pattern that isn't just stockinette, um, so that it kind of masks that, that biasing. Um, there are also, I mean, another very common structure for yarns is what's called a chainette construction, and unfortunately I don't have one on hand that I can show you, but um, it, they're basically those yarns that when you look at them closely look like I-cord, because that's exactly what they are. Um, they are yarns that, where the ply has been basically I-corded onto itself to make, and then the I-cord itself becomes the yarn. And, um, and those can be super squishy too, and in fact they can be really nice because they can give some spring to a fiber that might not have it otherwise. If you find a chainette alpaca, for instance, there are, there are quite a few of those actually, and um, I think Barocco makes at least one of them. And um, so that kind of helps give the alpaca a little bit more of a, a springiness that can be really nice. So, yeah. There's probably a lot more I could say about fiber and, and ply structure, but um, I think that's probably enough for now. <laughs> um, I don't have a, I'm not going to do a kind of traditional technique video today, but I did have um, one quick tip to share with you. Again, so punny, because I'm going to talk about needle tips. That wasn't on purpose, though. Usually my puns aren't. I only realize it after the fact. So my, my suggestion is this, that, um, and, I, and actually, I do have a chainette yarn that I am working with, but I can't show it to you because it's a, a new yarn that the yarn company is about to put out, and they would probably send ninjas over to my house to murder me if I showed it to you. So I won't show you that. But it made me think about, because as I've, as I've been knitting with it, um, it's really easy to split that yarn is if you are using pointy tipped needles. And so my, my kind of tip for today is um, to think about needle tips when you are, or to, to try to pair up your needle tips with your yarns. A lot of people complain about yarns being splitty on Ravelry, and my thinking is always, well, you know, part of the problem might be you're just using the wrong needle tips. Uh, a lot of people tend to favor these really pointy tips. So these are, um, they're not the Knit Picks ones, but they're made in the same factory. Knitter's Pride. These are the Knitter's Pride needles, and they're ones that are even pointier than this. But this would, if you're having trouble splitting a yarn and you're using this kind of tip, then switch to something more like this. Uh, these are Addy Turbos. Uh, just the classic ones, not the lace. Um, and a lot of people, um, call them Addy Stumpos. <laughs> but sometimes that's just what you need, right? I mean, sometimes it's a good idea to have a blunt-tipped needle. So actually, it's something more like this that I'm using when I'm knitting with this chainette yarn, and I'm much happier. I'm not splitting the yarn anymore. So there's my, my tip for you. So that's it for this week. Um, I am need to tell you about where you can find me. Uh, my website is darkmatterknits.com, and um, you can find me on Ravelry as Elizabeth GM, and there is a Dark Matter Knits group there that is a lot of fun. You're welcome to join. I am Dark Matter Knits on Twitter and Instagram, and those are the places where I'm kind of most active. I do have a Facebook fan page as well. That's probably I did join Plurk at one point, but I was just like, ugh, that and Pinterest. I just, it was like one social media too many. Can't do it. Can't do it. Plus Pinterest, I don't know. It's sort of like it's been taken over by an aesthetic that just isn't mine. It's, it's like, to, to my mind, it's sort of like where the, to put, it's where, if you've ever seen Portlandia, <laughs> that put a bird on it sketch, I'll have to link to it. If you haven't seen it, oh my God. It's so funny. Put a burn on it is what Pinterest is all about. Maybe I haven't explored it enough, but I just feel like 
it's just not, it's not for me. There, now that I've alienated three quarters of my audience, <laughs> I will hopefully see you in a few weeks um, coming to you from France. Okay, happy knitting everyone. Bye.